Good afternoon, and welcome to the fourth interview in our second year of our six-week series of conversations with noted scholars and historians about the American presidency. The series is brought to you by the LBJ Presidential Library, the Osher, UT Osher Lifelong Learning Institute, and Humanities Texas. I'm Phil Barnes, and it is my privilege to chair the UT OLLI Enrichment Committee. Dr. Mark Lawrence, the director of the LBJ Presidential Library, and himself a widely respected historian, is the host for each of these interviews. This year, we are focusing on presidential decisions for war and peace. And from these conversations, we are learning just how complex and awful difficult those decisions could be. As a participant in the webinar, you may present questions throughout the program for our Q&A segment by using the Q&A function to write and submit them, and I certainly encourage you to do that. Our Q&A host today is Sarah McCracken, the Director of Public Programs for the LBJ Presidential Library. William Embleton is Executive Director and William Powers, Jr. Chair of the Clement Center for National Security at the University of Texas at Austin, where he is Associate Professor in the LBJ School of Public Affairs. He is a member of the Council of Foreign Relations, a contributing editor of the Foreign Policy Magazine, and his commentary has appeared in numerous outlets most notably the Wall Street Journal and NPR, among others. He is the author of Peacemaker, Ronald Reagan, The Cold War, and The World on the Brink. As he documents in this important account of the Reagan years, Ronald Reagan came to the White House with an overriding faith in democracy, and a belief that Soviet communism and the threat of nuclear war must end. Reagan's faith in democracy was grounded and sustained by his personal belief in God, and that religious freedom was fundamental to individual liberty, and both were antithetical to Soviet communism, or, for that matter, all totalitarian regimes. <clears throat> Excuse me. And thus, President Reagan abhorred the treatment of Jews in the Soviet Union, the Soviets' repression of political dissent, and the attendant human rights abuses. And he made that quite clear. Reagan also believed that the absence of individual freedoms protected by the rule of law would lead inevitably to the decline and failure of the Soviet system. And the Soviet style command economy was inherently inflexible and rigid, suppressing the individual initiative and creativity essential to economic growth. These were the fundamental beliefs that Ronald Reagan brought to his series of meetings with Mikhail Gorbachev and Summits, pushing the Soviets with an arms race and ideological contest toward economic and political collapse, all the while extending an olive branch of diplomacy. The Reagan presidency ended in January of 1989. Less than three years later, in December of 1991, the Soviet Union collapsed and 15 newly independent nations were born, including a Russia with, at that time, a democratically elected anti-communist leader. A remarkable accomplishment. Now we have the opportunity to learn more about this defining period in presidential history from the author of this remarkable book. So I am delighted to welcome for today's interview, William Embodden, author of the Peacemaker, 
Ronald Reagan, the Cold War, and the world on the blink, break. And now, to Mark Lawrence. Well, thank you, Phil, and welcome, everyone. Good afternoon. It's great to be back with you for, as Phil mentioned, this fourth interview in our series. I hope, by the way, that everyone is safe and warm. If you're joining us from Texas, it's been a rough week, and I hope that this event can bring you a little bit of distraction from what's going on around us. And welcome especially to our special guest, Will Inboden. Um, thank you so much, Will, for making time to be with us. Great, great to have you. Thanks, Mark. It's great, great to be here with you. You know, Will, when, when it comes to presidential leadership and decision making for war and peace, there are a few stories, it seems to me, so compelling as Ronald Reagan's management of the end of the Cold War, this eight year saga that transformed the East West confrontation into a new era in, in geopolitical history and how this process played out. Uh, the roles of these larger than life figures like Mikhail Gorbachev and Ronald Reagan are, of course, truly fascinating historians that have drawn an awful lot of attention over the years, deservedly from biographers and, and journalists and, and, and historians. But no one, it seems to me, is better placed than you to help us think about these subjects, given the re very recent publication of your fantastic new book, the, peacekeep the Peacekeeper. Obviously, we want to dive into a lot of what you cover in this, in this lengthy book in the time ahead of us here, but it seemed to me a good way to get started, to help us appreciate the enormity of what happened under Ronald Reagan's leadership, is to talk about the situation that he inherited as he stepped into office in January of 1981. Tell us what the world situation was like so that we can then move on and talk about everything that changed in the following eight years. Sure. Thanks, Mark. And um, for our, our viewers, and you know, I hope uh, at least a good number of you will have a chance to pick up and, and read the book, you'll see that it is very much just focused on the eight years of Reagan's presidency and then foreign policy You know, with it, within those eight years. So it's not a full-length biography of, of him. But I say that by way of preface because, as Mark asks, I do spend the first uh, chapter trying to set the scene, uh, especially on the world situation in the 1970s and the, the challenges uh, the, that Reagan inherits when he takes when he's elected in November of 1980 and then when he takes the oath of office in January of 1981. And, uh, you know, in a word, the 70s had, were a terrible decade uh, for the United States and for, and for much of the world. Um, I know many of our viewers here will have uh, have first firsthand memories of them, uh, but just to rattle off a number of the, the challenges or difficulties that the United States, uh, you know, uh, found itself facing from the 1970s, and that shaped a lot of the uh, difficulties that, that Reagan then encountered. Uh, so we had lost the war in Vietnam, um, as I've often put it. When Reagan takes the oath of office in January of 1980, it is almost, in January of 1981, it is almost eight years to the day when the last American combat troops had, had left Vietnam and the Paris Peace Accords had been signed. And so, you know, we can think back to just eight years ago, uh, you know, say 2015, that doesn't feel like distant history. That is almost yesterday, right? And so the traumas of Vietnam were still very fresh for the country. And, you know, of course, our, our host, Mark Lawrence, is one of the country's foremost, scholar, foremost scholars on this. Uh, but for the Cold War, you know, the standoff between the United States and the Soviet Union, the Soviet bloc, um, Vietnam was the first in what becomes a cascade of successful communist revolutions and takeovers across the developing world throughout the 1970s. And so in addition to South Vietnam, uh, Laos falls to uh, communism, Cambodia does, Mozambique, uh, Ethiopia, Angola, uh, Nicaragua. The Soviet Union invades uh, Af Afghanistan. Uh, Grenada falls to communism. Uh, and uh, now each of those stories has its own complexities. Each is in part a product of, of local factors. But the, uh, the sponsorship or the support by the Soviet Union and some of its proxies like Cuba was also a, fact, a factor in, either, in, in each of those. And so by November of 1980, if you are just keeping a tally sheet in the Cold War, it appears like the United States is losing. It appears like the free world is losing and the communist bloc is winning, is advancing, just in terms of, you know, the, the number of new communist, communist governments. Um, 
Uh, in addition, in the actual standoff between the United States and the Soviet Union, if you just want to look at the military balance there, it also looks like the United States is losing, or at least has fallen way behind. Uh, the Soviet Union hits the apex of its military might sometime in 1981 or 82, probably, uh, whereas the American military was still underfunded, demoralized uh, from the loss in Vietnam and then subsequent uh, budget, budget cuts and undergoing a rocky transition from the draft to the all-volunteer force. So the American military seems weakened uh, in comparison to the Soviets. Uh, the United States has other internal problems. Our economy is not in good shape. Um, we're experiencing several years of stagflation. You may remember uh, that perverse combination of high unemployment and high uninflation, excuse me, and high inflation. Uh, and of course, then the Fed had to jack up interest rates. And so it just seemed like the American economy could not get going again. And uh, that in turn leads to further national division uh, and, and, and despondency. Uh, uh, of course, the OPEC oil embargo had uh, had also damaged the American economy, but also even more seemed to damage America's own sense of uh, confidence in itself. You know, we couldn't even fuel our our cars at the gas station, let alone fuel fuel our economy and, and fuel fuel our society. Uh, and then in 1979, the Iranian Revolution, and then the subsequent hostage crisis of 52 American diplomats and spies being held captive uh, by the, the new Iranian regime for, for about a year, year and a half. Uh, and so all of those factors uh, had contributed to a sense that the United States is just a demoralized, weakened, crippled giant, uh, just is not as capable economically or militarily as, as, as it used to be. Uh, and even a sense that maybe, you know, democracy and free markets uh, have seen, you know, their, their best days were behind them. Finally, one other uh, challenge of particular interest, I think, to the series uh, uh, on the American presidency is when Reagan took office, a lot of people thought that the presidency itself, the office of the presidency was, was broken. Uh, or at least uh, uh, irresistibly, irredeemably weakened. Uh, you know, one general rule of thumb that we can use for a successful presidency, it's overly simplistic, but general one is, uh, does that president complete two terms in office? You know, does he complete a first term, and get reelected and complete a, complete a second term? Uh, and uh, the, the last time an American president had completed two terms was Eisenhower, when, when Reagan takes office 20 years earlier. And we had had five presidents since then who had not been able to complete two terms in office. You know, Kennedy had been killed by an assassin's bullet. LBJ, again, you know, obviously the namesake for uh, the institution hosting us today, had foregone re-election partly because of uh, the country turning against him over Vietnam. Nixon, of course, had resigned in disgrace over the Watergate scandal. Ford had been defeated for uh, re-election after just you know, two years of trying to fill out uh, Nixon's term. And then Carter had just been defeated after one term. And so those are you know, Democrats, Republicans, different circumstances, but five different American presidents who hadn't been able to complete two terms. Not two, two terms. And, uh, and so there was a sense among a lot of Americans that the country can't be restored until the office of the presidency itself can be restored. And, and maybe, maybe, it, maybe it can't be. Maybe it is just now, now a, a broke, broken institution. So all that to say, it was a very difficult hand that Reagan inherited. Now we'll fast forward to 1989, the year mm -hmm. Ronald Reagan left office. November of that year, a little after Reagan had handed the reins to George Bush, the Berlin Wall is breached. People are literally standing, dancing on the on the Berlin Wall. The, the Cold War is clearly crumbling, and it sure looks like the United States has prevailed in many ways. It would take a couple more years, of course, for the Soviet Union to collapse, but tremendously transformative things have, have happened in the world. A, a central point of your book, it seems to me, is to show the importance of Ronald Reagan to that story, and especially to the grand strategic vision that sat in Ronald Reagan's head as he navigated very difficult times across those eight years. Tell us about Ronald Reagan's strategic vision, a vision that you say succeeded beyond even his imagining on page three of the book. What was his strategic vision? Yeah, so to oversimplify, I think he comes into office with three big goals, all of which are interrelated. Uh, the first is uh, to see the demise of Soviet communism and the end of the Cold War, uh, and he's pretty explicit about that. The second is to dramatically reduce the risk of nuclear war, okay? And that is, of course, derivative from the first, but there, it, in some ways, it's, it's also a separate goal in its own right. And the third is to expand freedom in the world. Uh, and importantly, 
not just in terms of bringing down Soviet communism as inimical to freedom, but also to support the growth of economic freedom, of an open trading order, of, of democracy, including uh, with a lot of America's uh, right-wing military dictatorship al allies too. Uh, and, it's, uh, and so if we take those as his, those three, you know, as the strategic goals he's wanting to pursue, by you know a year or two after he leaves office, even by the time he's leaving office, but especially by a year or two after he leaves office, there's been tremendous advances on on all three. Um, and so that's where he had a pretty transformative strategic vision. Uh, you know, as I've summed it up before, um, almost every previous Cold War president had seen the Soviet Union as a geopolitical rival to be managed and contained. You know, no, no other American president wanted the Soviet Union to advance, of course, right? They all share that in common with, with Reagan. But I don't, I don't think that any other American president had actually envisioned the Soviet Union uh, being, being defeated, the Cold War itself ending. I mean, there's a sense that this is a pretty permanent part of the geopolitical landscape. You know, when Reagan takes office, Soviet Union had been around for over six decades and prevailing assumptions that it's going to be around for you know several several more decades if not into the in, indefinite future um similarly there was a sense that uh democracy uh was in retreat you know by the end of the 19, 1970s you know the really the only democracies in the world were in at the time in western europe north america and then japan was the only democracy in in, in asia um you know as you know great scholars like you know our own austin native hal brands and others have pointed out we now, looking back, can see that there were a number of structural forces going on in the world throughout the, uh, you know, beneath the surface in the 1970s that Reagan uh, benefits from, that he and his team take advantage of and try, try to accelerate. And so certainly my book is trying to emphasize the role of presidential leadership and vision on something like this. And I do think Reagan's policies are really essential to understand this story, but, but he also benefits from some of those broader broader global, global trends and those feed into his strategy. Well, one of the really distinctive things about Ronald Reagan, at least to me, is the way in which he could simultaneously be the hawk who advocated a major military buildup and the dove who was always willing to negotiate with the mm -hmm. Soviets. Talk, if you would, a little bit about the balance of carrots and sticks, if I can put it that way, or dove and hawk, uh, mm -hmm. that, that seems to have um, driven Reagan's outlook toward the Soviet Union really from the outset, if not, in fact, from the years before he became president. Yeah, no, th this is a great question, Mark. It's a really important theme of the book that Reagan is this very enigmatic figure where he holds uh, with equal tenacity to these two different impulses. And he's, he's working a lot of his time as president to, to reconcile them, maybe if you will. But, but again, on the one hand, he is emphatically an anti-Soviet, anti-communist hardliner. He is, and he wants to do an aggressive military buildup and he wants to confront them rhetorically. And it's clear he wants to put pressure on this system uh, to weaken it and hopefully to, to crack, crack it apart. Um, and that's why his you know, famous Somewhat jingoistic, but I think right in the same level, uh, profound line that you know, my theory of the Cold War is we win, they lose, right? And that's what uh, you know the more hard hardliners like to gravitate to. At the same time, he also, from decades before he becomes president, was a nuclear abolitionist. He wanted to see all nuclear weapons abolished. He is terrified of nuclear weapons and nuclear war. Uh, he is very committed to keeping the Cold War cold. Uh, in terms of, you know, he does not want it to turn into a, a nuclear exchange or a devastating conventional war in, in Europe. He's very reticent about actually using force. Um, in eight years as president, he only deploys ground troops in combat once, and that's in Grenada, which is really over in a weekend. It's a pretty small operation. And he, from the outset of his presidency, is very committed to genuine outreach to Soviet leaders. He wants to find one who can be a negotiating partner. He wants to assure them that the United States doesn't want to blow them up and blow, blow the world up. He wants them to work with him, not just to slow the arms race or manage the arms race, but to end the arms race and even end, end all nuclear weapons. And that part of him is also confounding, and, and especially that part of him elicited quite a bit of opposition and criticism from his own conservative Republican base. Uh, and so, uh, you know, in hindsight, I think there's a uh, you know, 
esteem for Reagan has probably climbed, you know, in the years since he left office. I think I hope my book is, is a part of that since it's overall a very favorable assessment. But one thing I was really reminded of in researching and writing this is what a polarizing figure he was at the time. Certainly a lot of criticism from, from the left, but also especially in his second term as he's building this partnership with Gorbachev, as he's eliminated all intermediate, intermediate range nuclear missiles and talking about abolishing a lot of them. Uh, fierce revolt from, from the right, a lot of criticism from conservative Republicans in Congress and conservative uh, pundits too. And so uh, both of those sides of Reagan uh, have to be, I think, appreciated and comprehended to understand the, the full story. And I know there used to be a, a very popular idea. I think I bought into it, honestly, for a long time, that there was in the middle of Reagan's years in office, uh, the Reagan reversal, right? Mm -hmm. this, yeah. this, this profound shift from the hawkish Ronald Reagan to the more dovish Ronald Reagan. And, and the big question was, okay, what happened? What changed? Mm -hmm. But you, 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 I think very effectively in your book, kind of reject the whole idea of the reversal. Could you, could you unpack that a little bit and talk about why that's not a good way to understand Reagan? Sure, yes, uh, and thanks for, uh, thanks for bringing that. And that was one of the questions I'd had when I'd started the research in this book several years ago. Um, you know, I was, I was open to th there being a Reagan reversal, but I just, as you, uh, as you laid out there, I became convinced it just wasn't the case. Uh, and I, I think, you know, the, the main principle is throughout his eight years as president, uh, Reagan was committed to both strong pressure on the Soviet system and diplomatic outreach. And so the Reagan reversal thesis is more, well, he's a hardliner in the first term, and then he becomes more accommodating in outreach in the second term. And rather, I see quite a bit of that outreach in the first term, and also continued hawkishness and pressure in the second term. And I'll just mention a few examples of this. Um, so in the first term, just you know, three months into office, after he's denounced the Soviets rhetorically a bunch of times and launched his military buildup, uh, after he survives the assassination attempt, he also writes this um, very moving, heartfelt, personal letter to, to Brezhnev, the Soviet leader at the time, saying, hey, listen, we hold the fate of the world in our hands. Can we be friends? Can we talk? I don't want to blow up the world. Uh, after surviving this assassin's bullet, I have even a you know, more strong sense of the need to bring peace. Uh, he's really, really committed to peace. Um, and even some of Reagan's more dovish advisors at the State Department think this letter is way too soft. We can't let him send this thing. It, uh, you know, it's... Um, uh, I could you know, give other examples like that from his from his first term of that, that real genuine outreach to the Soviets. But also in the second term, while he is negotiating with Gorbachev, building this really inspiring partnership for peace with Gorbachev, Reagan is keeping up the pressure. Uh, this is when he dramatically increases uh, our covert support for the Mujahideen in Afghanistan, who, you know, to be you know, rather gruesome about it, uh, are sending hundreds of Soviet soldiers home in body bags every month, being killed by American weapons, and and, and Reagan is authorizing this and accelerating it. Uh, so it's it's not just you know a rhetorical hardline. He continues the defense buildup. He continues economic pressure on the Soviet Union. Uh, he continues confronting them rhetorically. As when he you know in June of 1987, he says, "Tear down this wall at the at the Berlin Wall over the objections of all of his advisors who think that that is too provocative." Um, uh, he continues uh, supporting um, human rights uh, uh, and political dissidents and religious dissidents inside the Soviet Union, even though that's driving Gorbachev crazy. He continues holding on to the strategic defense initiative that you know, rather fantastical missile shield vision he has to make uh, you know, the Soviet uh, nuclear arsenal ob obsolete. So all these pressure prongs that he continues doing in the in the second term while doing the outreach and diplomacy with Gorbachev. And so that's why, you know, he'll occasionally recalibrate, maybe a little more pressure here, a little more outreach here. Uh, but those two prongs are there are there throughout, I think. You mentioned a little while ago that your book is not a biography, and yet there is a a a, a Ronald Reagan, the man, uh, the personality mm -hmm. that emerges in your book. And it strikes me that he's a very unusual, peculiar, you used the word a few minutes ago, enigmatic person. Let's talk a little bit about Ronald Reagan, the, the person. I mean, here's an unusual person who is willing to buck the critics on both sides, as you pointed out. Mm -hmm. He's willing to conceive a big vision that is not very popular or really widely held. He, as you point out, he was his own strategist. He really didn't 
get these big ideas, you know, from his staff in a way perhaps other presidents have tended to do. Talk mm -hmm. a little bit about who he was and, and how he came to have such an unusual vision and the confidence to push it against a bureaucracy that wasn't always very happy to hear what he had in mind. Yeah, yeah. Uh, again, a, a terrific question. Um, and here, I'll certainly share some of my own thoughts and findings from my research, but also uh, I benefited very much from um, our, our fellow uh, uh, history faculty member, uh, colleague, Bill Brands, who did a great you know, biography of Reagan and gave me some of these insights too. So uh, so first, Reagan as a, as a person um, is a man of paradoxes. So on the one hand, uh, everyone who worked for him uh, or who interacted with him would describe him as this uh, really warm, fun, affable personality, but at the same time, inscrutable and hard to get to know. Uh, and so they enjoyed working for him, but none of them really felt like they knew him. And he didn't really have any close friends. Certainly the closest friend he had was Nancy Reagan, you know, the, the, first, the first lady. Uh, but other than that, no, no, no real close friends. Um, and he has uh, tremendous self-confidence. Uh, he's a very inner-directed person, to use the old habits of the heart term. Um, some of this comes from his Christian faith. Uh, some of this comes from uh, being, at the time, the oldest elected president who had spent, you know, several decades before the presidency thinking about what he believed and being pretty firm in it. Some of it comes from his own reading. He, even though he's not an intellectual, he was more of an avid reader than I think people had appreciated. Uh, and just a man of strong convictions. But at the same time, uh, he is very, uh, so even though he's resolute on what he wants and what his ideas are, he's very conflict averse and he's a terrible manager. And so this is why he, even though he's got his own clear vision of what he wants, he doesn't always communicate it really well to his staff or, or he doesn't enforce it with them. And so this is why every White House has its feuds and divisions, but the Reagan White House, much worse than most, right? And this is why you have deep acrimony and feuding and backbiting and leaking among uh, among the staff throughout the eight years. Um, and, and Reagan doesn't like that, but he doesn't really police it very much because he is so conflict averse and just wants everyone to, to, to be happy and be happy and get, get along. Um, um, so, uh, so that's, yeah, like I said, he's, I can't pretend to say that I feel like I, I cracked the code, you know, cracked the, the code and then, you know, the first, you know, scholar to finally understand everything that was, that was going on inside his head. Um, there, there still are some puzzles there. We can know a little more now than we used to, just as, you know, his diaries have now been, you know, declassified and published. And I you know, read those very closely, uh, quite a bit of his personal correspondence. And then now, just in the last few years, a lot of the transcripts of his meetings with heads of state uh, or National Security Council meetings have been um, declassified and made available. And so the, um, the, the private Reagan, the Reagan behind closed doors is more available now to scholars than it was before through these records. Um, and so they, those you know, give me some more insights. But again, there still are some, some mysteries. He seems to have, at, le at least to my reading of your book, really have bucked the dominant views on at least two questions, right? He seems to have believed, in contrast to the conventional wisdom, that democracy really was gaining the upper hand. It may not have mm -hmm. always been visible, but you know the world was headed in the right direction in Reagan's view. Mm -hmm. He appears to have believed as well that the Soviet Union was much more fragile mm -hmm. economically in particular than much of the conventional wisdom mm -hmm. um, held. How, what, what was his experience like in pushing back against you know, what were some pretty strongly held views, it seems to me, in the American national security bureaucracy uh, throughout his, um, at least the early parts of his presidency? Yeah, yeah. So uh, he, uh, this goes back to when I mentioned him being interdirected. He's also one I've described before as a convictional politician, meaning that he just, he arrives in office with some very deeply held convictions. On most of them, I think he's largely correct. So, you know, I'll certainly tip my hand there, not necessarily all of them, but whether or not you agree or disagree, I think anyone looking at him has to conclude he really believed this stuff. Uh, and he held to it very tenaciously. And, and to mention a few of those, and this, this gets into how and why he was able or willing to challenge the conventional wisdom on the possibilities of the spread of, of freedom, uh, of democracy, and also the, the vulnerabilities of the Soviet system. So first, he just believed as a matter of conviction that democracy is the, you know, the highest form of government, the one most conducive to human dignity and human liberty and human flourishing. He believes similarly that free markets and free enterprise are the best economic systems. Um, he had 
developed that partly through his own growing up experiences, but also through a lot of his own reading in the 1950s and 60s. Um, uh, he believes that human beings are more innately religious and spiritual people, um, that, you know, most of us, you know, throughout human history and around the world are hardwired to believe in some sort of higher power, some sort of uh, transcendence. Um, and so when he looked at Soviet communism, he saw a system that stood in you know, as an affront to all three of those pillars, right? It, uh, rather than democratic self-government, it is a, a dictatorship, um, a totalitarian dictatorship, you know, not just saying that people can't vote for their own leaders, but almost trying to control what they think. Of course, instead of a free market economy, it is a command economy uh, where the state owns all the means of uh, production. Uh, and then it is officially atheistic and not just as a you know, tenet of belief, but that it actively persecuted religious believers, uh, especially Christians, Christians and Jews. And so <clears throat> Reagan just had this conviction that a system like that is not sustainable because it goes so contrary to his beliefs about human nature, uh, human, human dignity, the way that a good and well-functioning society can work. I mean, he knew that it can last for a time by, you know, but, but, it, but it required so much control uh, and uh, such an imposition of its own alien dogmas on otherwise unwilling populations. He thought that economy can't continue itself because it's just not gonna work. It's not allowing people the freedom of, of creativity, of private property, of, uh, of, of productivity, of, of prosperity. It's not allowing them a voice in their future, you know, all, 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 these, uh, all these different things. And it's not allowing them to believe in worship, uh, believe in and worship God. But he also, uh, throughout the 1970s, and then including early in his time in office, um, is very intrigued by the human factor and fascinated by what is life actually like behind the Iron Curtain? What is life like in, inside the, so, the so, Soviet Union? And so anytime he would have a chance to meet with a Soviet dissident or say an East German dissident or you know, someone free, you know, because when it comes to the West, he's you know, freed from uh, one of those systems. He would just ask them, you know, what's life like there? And he'd hear overwhelmingly, we don't trust our government. We fear our government. We don't like our government. The bread lines are really long. We're all very despondent about our futures. Um, we, uh, and we all want to leave and, and escape to the West if we, if we can. Um, you know, we don't like the war in Afghanistan. We don't like uh, the, um, the, way, the way our kids are being treated. You know, and so that also made him suspicious. Uh, hearing these personal accounts of people who had a firsthand lived experience with the system made him suspicious of official economic figures that the Kremlin is putting out uh, or CIA analysis saying, well, we think that the Soviet economy will keep growing for another one to 2% a year and, and, and may not be the most productive in the world, but it'll, it'll keep going or the Soviet system is really stable. That, that, that just uh, flew in the face of his own convictions and what he was hearing from people that lived under it. Well, you have a lot to say in your book. You were, you're in fact, just referencing this about Reagan's religious beliefs. And mm -hmm. to my eye, this is something that you're really emphasizing in a way that Again, to my knowledge, no previous biographer or historian has has really done. Is that something that you expected to find in 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 your study of Reagan? Um, and ultimately, how important was it? Maybe hard to quantify, but you know, f at least roughly, how important a factor was that in driving uh, Reagan's decision making, making him? Yeah. Yeah, thanks. So this, yeah, this this is a big big theme of the book, as you point out. I would say I um, I didn't necessarily expect to find it when I started the research, but I was open to finding it. Of course, as you you know, some of my previous academic work on the role of religious faith in the Truman and Eisenhower administrations. I you know I'm I guess attuned to you know looking for as an American president, uh, you know, bringing religious convictions to bear on something, and there are. Um, uh, one or two other scholars, uh, Paul Pengor uh, at a liberal arts college in Ohio, who had done a, a book on Reagan's faith, which I had read, and he had uncovered some interesting stuff. And thought, okay, I think there, there may be something here, and I want to explore it more. But uh, again, even with that, I was I was surprised at just how central it is to Reagan, especially because when I started the research, I knew, um, okay, he rarely attended church while he's president. Uh, and yes, he would use religious language in public, and he appealed to the religious right as uh, you know part of his um, uh, core, the core of his political base in his two campaigns. And so I knew that there was you know what we scholars sometimes call an say instrumentalist approach to religion there. But what he actually believed and how genuine it was, I was I was unsure, of, but was open open finding. 
And so that's why, as, again, as you alluded, once I dove into the research, I found, wow, there's a lot more here. Um, and some of it comes out in his personal diaries uh, or, or, or letters that he's writing to friends and family. You know, as well, this is someone who has a very you know, genuine and deeply held faith, even if he's somewhat private about it. Um, it's not just something he'll say reference in a, in a campaign speech. You know, just a few examples. So um, when he's lying on the operating table in the emergency room at the hospital right after the assassination attempt, uh, and we now know, you know, very comes very close to death there, right? If the bullet would have been just a, a millimeter more to one side, it probably would have probably would have killed him. Uh, and as he writes in his diary, uh, when, once he recovers, he says, as I was laying on the operating table, I was praying that God would spare my life. But then I realized, how can I pray that God will save me if I have hatred in my heart towards that confused young man who shot me? And so I prayed that God would forgive that young man because aren't we all lost sheep and don't we all need God's forgiveness? Um, and again, this is a very intensely personal moment as he's almost dying. He only records it in his diary. He never gives a speech on this, right? So that's where, you know, we've got to take that, we've got to take that seriously. And then he later writes that he thinks that God spared him uh, from the assassination and from death in part to help end the Cold War and to bring, he says, to end the Cold War and particularly to end the threat of nuclear war and nuclear destruction. And so from that personal faith, you get also that sense of resolve and core inner conviction, which I think is one of the keys to help and understand why he's able to withstand all the criticism and opposition to his policies. Um, one of the vignette I'll, I'll share in this, which brings together the Cold War policy and his personal faith is, um, as you know, he builds a really genuine friendship with Gorbachev over their four years together being in their respective leadership roles. And, you know, they certainly have their very big differences in some ways, some different end goals. Gorbachev, they both want to, you know, bring uh, peace to the Cold War, but Gorbachev wants to preserve Soviet communism and, Gor and Reagan still wants to end it. But along the way, they build a very genuine friendship. And Reagan is just very personally grieved that Gorbachev is an atheist. Mm -hmm. And it, it's not just that Reagan doesn't like that Soviet communism is atheistic and that it throws Christians and Jews in the gulag. He's very grieved that his now friend Gorbachev doesn't believe in God. And so their final summit meeting in Moscow in May of 1988, Cold War is already starting to thaw. You know, the tensions are winding down. It, it's still there, but, you know, they've they've uh, signed and ratified the Intermediate Nuclear Forces Treaty, um, eliminating you know, all those, you know, dreadful intermediate range nuclear weapons. Uh, they're, um, you know, opening ties between the two countries and other fronts. But Reagan spends a good part of his time with Gorbachev in his final summit meeting trying to get Gorbachev to believe in God. And it's this very personal thing. And Reagan speaks, you know, very candidly about his grief that his own son, Ron, is an atheist. And he says, I really wish I could persuade my own son to believe in God. And, and I, I wish I could persuade you to as well. Um, and again, this is not about a Cold War policy or anything, right? This is just Reagan's own personal faith and personal spiritual convictions and his way of expressing care to Gorbachev. And it's touching to read the transcripts because Gorbachev, on the one hand, is pretty baffled by this. This is not usually what, you know, superpowers or leaders are talking about. But Gorbachev also takes it seriously and sees that this is coming from a place of genuine concern. And he doesn't seem to start believing in God, but he says he'll think about it. And he yeah. really appreciates this as a gesture of friendship on Reagan's part. So that that was another just very revealing moment for me about the, the genuineness and depth of his uh, his faith. Well, you mentioned the the all important, I mean, to put it mildly, relationship between Reagan and Gorbachev. Take us into that part of, of your story. When Reagan first encounters Gorbachev, there's a feeling out process, some skepticism, certainly some vigorous clashes over human rights and, and SDI mm -hmm. and and perhaps other issues as well. And yet it over time develops into the much warmer relationship that you just mentioned. Tell us about some perhaps of the key moments in that in that developing relationship and generally how this developed over time. Sure, yes. And, and I'm going to uh, rewind a little bit to actually start in 1981. Um, it, it's because this is, uh, again, one of the, I thought, pretty interesting research findings uh, from the book. And, you know, it will be a somewhat controversial one among our fellow scholars, but I think there's a credible argument to be made here. When Reagan first comes into office, as we were talking earlier, he has, he already has a strategy in mind of combining pressure and outreach to the Soviets. So he wants to pressure that system, deter their military, uh, Know, uh, accelerate the cracks and weaknesses in it, but also outreach to Soviet leaders and uh, and see if they can negotiate, uh, you know, reduce risk of nuclear war. And 
His main uh, Soviet advisor on the National Security Council staff is Richard Pipes, um, a Harvard professor, a very eminent uh, scholar of Russian history, who was also a you know, real hardliner, uh, a hawk, and had you know, taken a two-year leave from Harvard to, to work for Reagan. And Pipes and Reagan have this really interesting dialogue as Reagan tasked Pipe with put, putting together uh, you know, Reagan's anti-Soviet strategy or his, his Cold War strategy. And he and Pipes develop a very explicit prong in that strategy, which is that we are not just pressuring the Soviet system to, to weaken it and deter them from attacking us. We are pressuring it to strengthen its reformist impulses and to produce a reformist leader. And, and I, I, that was very interesting to me um, because, it, again, it shows that Reagan, from the beginning, wants to find a reformist leader in the Soviet Union that he can negotiate with, that can be a, a partner for peace. Um, and it takes, you know, three Soviet leaders and four and a half, a little over four years for that to actually come along, right? So Brezhnev and a drop up in Chernyko die in quick succession and are not the reformist leaders that Reagan is looking for. But in March of 1985, you know, four years and two months after Reagan takes office, the Politburo selects Gorbachev, who is committed from day one to being a reformist leader. Now, I want to be very clear, the main reason why Gorbachev is selected by the Politburo is internal Soviet forces and, uh, and, and, and the internal Soviet system. I'm not saying that Reagan dictates the Soviets, you shall pick Gorbachev. But I do think it's very clear that part of, because of Reagan's strategy of pressure was to kind of back the Kremlin into a corner where they feel like, okay, we other ways aren't working. We, we need to go the reformist path, or at least to strengthen some of those reformers. That's at least got to be part of the story of Gorbachev sure. coming to power. And even if it's only a small part of the story, here's why it matters the most. I titled the chapter where Gorbachev comes to power, Waiting for Gorbachev. Reagan recognizes and embraces Gorbachev a lot sooner than most other you know, uh, members of his administration um, or uh, you know, Soviet experts, he, because he'd been looking for a reformer. And if you're looking for something, you're going to be more likely to find it. And so because he'd been looking for a Soviet reformer to come along, he thinks, OK, Gorbachev, I think this, this may be the one. Um, not convinced at first, right? There's the testing out. So again, to your you know, yeah. question about you know, some of these iconic moments, their first summit is in Geneva in November of 1985. And by the conventional standards of evaluating summits, it's a failure because they don't come out with any big new agreements, right? That's usually historically when American presidents would meet with a Soviet leader. You want to see some policy agreements, some treaties, uh, arms control, exchanges, economic liberalization, like that. They don't get any of that. But what happens in, in their, their two days together in Geneva is they spend a lot of time together one on one. And a lot of time together in groups uh, ends up being about 12, 14 hours total. They're negotiating sessions and they're really testing each other out. They both come away from it thinking this is the guy I can do business with. And they even say that they're closing uh, their closing press conference before they go out on stage. You know, Reagan turns to Gorbachev and says, you know, kind of laughs. He says, your hardliners back in Moscow and my hardliners back in America are not going to like us becoming friends. But um, but let's you know, let's essentially torment all of them and let's really let's really do something transformative here. And Gorbachev laughs and says, you know, absolutely, we can. Um, the next big one, of course, is Reykjavik uh, a year later, um, uh, October of 1986. And again, by the conventional standards of summits, it also is a failure. And it's, even, it's very much seen as one at the time because they don't come up with any tangible agreements uh, or, uh, or, or new policies. But at Reykjavik, they both push each other as, as far as they can, and they both agree that they want to abolish all nuclear weapons. This is stunning, right? No American and Soviet leader had ever come close to anything about this, uh, about this before. And, and re again, reading the transcripts of those meetings, you can also see them racing out to each other. Okay, let's cut half our arsenal. Uh, you know, so let's cut half our nuclear missiles. No, let's cut half of all of our nuclear weapons, our bombs, our missiles, all that. No, let's cut them all, right? Eliminate all of them. Um, it falls apart, and you know, I we won't go into all the details. That it falls apart over a disagreement over SDI, over Reagan wanting to hold on to his vision of an anti-missile, anti-missile system. Um, and we can you know talk more about that if you'd like. But the fact that they both realize, wow, this guy is willing to take tremendous political risks. This guy is willing to be incredibly visionary and in moving out of that steel Cold War paradigm of mutual assured destruction and a balance of terror. And we've both got to hold on to the, you know, some amount of these nuclear arsenals. And that is why just a few months later, they turn that 
failed summit and to the incredible success of abolishing all intermediate range nuclear missiles, um, you know, withdrawing them from Europe, uh, and then starting to cut conventional arsenals and moving towards that transformation in, in the Cold War. Uh, nicely done. You covered on a lot of ground there. <laughs> Sorry, I know. I, I get split no, up on this stuff. But you, yeah, it's, you know, yeah. it's sweeping across a very long period of time in a, um, in a, in a very complicated relationship. Will, just with an eye on the... Let me let me actually take a moment here and remind everyone who's listening, um, please uh, enter your questions into the Q&A button at the bottom of the Zoom screen. And I'll turn the floor over to Sarah McCracken in a few minutes here to, so that uh, Will can respond to questions from all of you who are out there listening. Um, Will, though, just a couple more from me. Um, first of all, um, your book is, is clearly very admiring of Reagan, no question about that. And yet, as you move through his administration, you do note some weaknesses and problems from time to time. What is the single most striking weakness, or if it's not too strong a word, failure on the part of the Reagan uh, administration as it made foreign policy? Yeah, I'll, um, there, there's a few I could mention, but I'll mention two which are related to each other. The first is I touched on earlier, the management failures, just not um, policing the the feuding and backbiting and squabbling and divisions within his his team because that over time wasn't just about people being upset with each other or slowing down policy implementation or leaking too much that in some real tangible ways produced some terrible policy outcomes i mean that, that's part of the story of the iran contra scandal you know which was really one of the big feelings but this it does bring me to the second one which is overall reagan's middle east policy it's hard to see it as a success and there's some, some real failures within it now the middle east is difficult okay i mean so let, you know i'll give him that and he inherits a, a difficult hand there but um you know the um the the terrorist bombing of the Marine barracks in Beirut in October 1983 kills 241 Marines. That's a tragedy. I mean, the fault for it, of course, is on Hezbollah. But when you look at what leads up to that, it is partly that Reagan just has a very confused, uncertain, unclear, ambivalent policy, which combines the worst of all worlds, where uh, the Defense Department, the Pentagon, didn't want the Marines there at all. The State Department wanted the Marines there in a much more forceful way to try to end the you know, Lebanese civil war and, and you know, get Israel to, to withdraw to complicated situation. And because Reagan uh, wouldn't arbitrate between his you know, squabbling Pentagon and State Department, he chooses the middling option, which is, well, let's put the Marines there, but they can't load their weapons. Uh, they can't guard themselves too well. They can't really fire back if they're fired upon. And so they're effectively sitting ducks and they're not able to even accomplish the, the, the mission. Um, and that is that is in part why they're so vulnerable to the to the suicide attack. Um, then related to that is, um, you know, out of that, then Hezbollah, sensing American weakness, uh, decides that it can also engage in a spree of hostage taking. And Reagan then reverses his own stated policy of we won't negotiate with terrorists and we won't sell arms to Iran by negotiating with terrorists and selling arms to Iran and not even being able to get the hostages released and violating American law along the way. And so, um, anyway, you know, it, other, more things I could say there, but the, the poor management leads pretty directly to a lot of the confusions and failures on his on his Middle East policy. Well, let me wrap up with just a, a question or two that perhaps unfairly takes you a bit beyond the chronology of your book and asks you to think about Ronald Reagan and how he is understood in more more recent times. Mm -hmm. um, it seems to me Reagan is is widely admired, um, mm -hmm. especially clearly among Republicans, among conservatives. And yet it seems that a lot of his core ideas that you really do such a great job teasing out in your book have really vanished from a current day political debate and from the mm -hmm. Republican Party, that sense of optimism, that mm -hmm. sense of well, the, the attachment to free trade, the openness to the celebration of the diversity of the American public, even uh, mm -hmm. bipartisanship in mm -hmm. some ways. Um, why do you think that Reagan remains so popular, kind of the gold standard in, in some ways, um, when people have, in many cases, really rejected a lot of what he stood for? Yeah, no, I've, I've also puzzled over that. And again, I, you know, as I hope readers will see, I wrote the book as a pure history. So it ends with the end of Reagan's presidency. You know, sketch a few things out in the epilogue. So I, I don't try to 
do a concluding chapter of and what's this mean for American politics or the Republican Party of the 21st century? Sure. But since you asked, all right, you know, I, <laughs> I, 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 I've, given, I've given, it, given it some thought. Um, I think part of it is uh, by most standards, and I, I certainly fall in this time, his presidency is a success, right? It just even look at, at the outcomes, you know, peaceful end of the Cold War, collapse of the Soviet Union, expansion of freedom, uh, uh, renewal of the American economy and, Amer and American strength. And, uh, you know, most Americans are, you know, Democrats and Republicans are pretty pragmatic and want things to work. And so when you just point to a, a presidency that on balance is pretty successful uh, and, and led by such a charismatic figure uh, as well. And he's electorally successful too, right? Then, you know, landslide re-election in 1984, uh, then his successor, you know, being elected in 1988. So it's almost like three Reagan terms. Uh, so that I think is a big part of why there is, you know, nostalgia for him among a lot of today's, today's Republicans. Um, but what I hope my book shows, or people who care to read it and see what his policies were, is Reagan's successful policies comes from I want to rattle off a number of things, which I think will speak for themselves. Strong commitment to allies, um, strong commitment to open trade, strong commitment to an optimistic and unifying vision of America, mm -hmm. strong commitment, uh, especially after his first couple of years, to human rights and democracy. And again, you know, we we'll talk more about that. But that is where he does reverse himself somewhat. He, by 83, 84, he no longer wants to support military dictators or anti-communists. He wants you know, democracy for, for, for everybody. Um, uh, he really sees America as a bastion of hope uh, and opportunity for immigrants and those seeking political asylum, those who have, especially those who have suffered in, in other countries. And that's why he used, you know, very, you know, pro-immigration. Pro uh, pro, pro um, and, and then this uh, certainly a very strong commitment to military strength, but with that, a commitment to diplomacy and negotiations uh, too. Uh, so those are the ingredients of his successful policies. And you know, my, I'm you know, still call myself. I'm still a Republican today. You know, call myself. And so my message to my fellow Republicans is: if you want to valorize Reagan, you want to understand why his policies were successful. Well, look at the, those particular convictions that that he held. Um, and I think and hope some of those should still have some purchase today. Well, I think you're hinting at an answer to my very next question, which is simply, what are the lessons of Ronald Reagan's management of foreign policy that we might do well to think about today? Yeah. Um, again, this is one I've certainly given a lot of thought to and has come up in, in other, other settings, but which I don't get into explicit in the book. Um, so, you know, the first always have to, you know, you'll appreciate this, Mark, my fellow historian, always have to be the good historian and say, well, you know, the 1980s were very different in a lot of ways than, than our moment today, whether, you know, U.S.-China and, and it's different from the U.S.-Soviet Union and, you know, any number of differences. That said, um, I, you know, a few general principles that I do think still uh, are, are worth uh, revisiting are this, um, this concept of integrating force and diplomacy. Uh, so too often in our prevailing debates these days, we'll talk about, well, we want a diplomatic solution rather than the use of force, something like that. And when we look at some of Reagan's biggest policy successes, it is often when he is uh, engaged in diplomacy, but backed up by the you know, credible threat of force, or at least backed up by a, by a strong military, which he's very reluctant to actually use in, in you know, he wants, he wants to negotiate successfully without having to fire shots, but there's that threat of it. And this is where George Schultz, the Secretary of State, is such an indispensable partner. I should have mentioned him sooner. Um, another is, um, doing a careful assessment of what America's traditional strengths really are, our alliances, you know, our allies, Reagan is so committed to them, uh, uh, our, our open society, uh, our values, uh, uh, not in a chauvinistic way, but values, especially insofar as they can be inspiring to, to others. This real sense of the free world actually meaning something. And then um, getting the theory of the case right with how we understand our, our main adversaries or challenges. And so, you know, I one, one way I've summarized Reagan's strategic vision or um, strategic revolution with the Soviet Union, and this will, I will apply this to China today, is his theory of the case was that um, the Cold War is fundamentally a battle of ideas that happens to be a great power competition between two rival superpowers. And most of his previous Cold War predecessors had seen the Cold War as primarily a 
you know, superpower competition or super standoff, great power competition that happens to have an ideological component. And so when Reagan reverses that theory of the case and puts the battle of ideas first, that enables him to see some of the Soviet uh, system's vulnerabilities in ways that others hadn't, hadn't necessarily fully appreciated. And so I do think there's something to be said to uh, putting that theory of the case a little more on the forefront of what we're dealing with, with Russia or China, China today of there is a battle of ideas going on. You know, Vladimir Putin and Xi Jinping have a very fundamentally different set of convictions about not just how they want their countries run, but how they want the world to work. Uh, and even if the particulars may be different, I think that General Reagan's sense of taking that competition of ideas seriously uh, and engaging in it more, more directly is also something worth, uh, worth emulating. Well, Professor Will Inboden, I want to say a huge word of thanks for this really fascinating conversation and an even bigger word of congratulations on the publication of The Peacemaker, Ronald Reagan, The Cold War, and The World on the Brink, a really fantastic book and a seminal contribution on any number of controversial and tremendously important subjects. Great to be with you, Will. Thanks again. Thank you so much, Mark. I enjoyed it. And now we questions from the audience, right? Yes, please. Um, awesome. Now let me turn it over to my colleague, uh, Sarah McCracken, who will uh, offer some questions. Thank you, Will. That was uh, terrific listening. Um, the first question is from Jeff, and he says, uh, you mentioned Schultz and I think Piper. He said, among Reagan's staff, who was the most influential in the path he took with the Soviet Union, especially in understanding their economy left them vulnerable? Yeah, uh, so I'll mention two advisors there. Certainly, George Schultz is is one, and he, and he uh, plays a very prominent role in the book. I try to make a case for him being the uh, greatest Secretary of State since uh, since Dean Acheson, at least, and maybe even further back than that. And um, uh, you know, many attributes of Schultz I could highlight, but a couple on this particular question about dealing with Soviets is Schultz was a trained economist. He had a PhD in economics from MIT. He had been OMB director and then secretary of the treasury in the Nixon administration. Schultz is the, the father of the G7, as we now know, like he really you know, creates that back in the 1970s. And so he's the most, uh, I think, economically literate secretary of state in history. And he uh, also sh you know, shared Reagan's sense of the Soviet economy's vulner vulnerabilities in ways that others, others haven't seen. But Schultz was also very committed to uh, Diplomacy, um, and yet diplomacy backed by that threat of force, uh, and so, uh, and so he is a very effective uh, alter ego and, and partner for Reagan. The other advisor I'll mention, who is a less known one, um, but one who I try to resurrect in the book as uh, very important, is Bill Clark. Uh, and Clark was Reagan's second national security advisor. He serves in the job for just two years, uh, uh, but he had he was. Um, probably Reagan's, clo uh, the closest to Reagan personally of all of his advisors, you know, the caveat that Reagan didn't have very many close friends. Um, Clark had been his chief of staff when he was governor of California uh, back in the 60s and 70s. He's a fellow rancher and cowboy, so they'd like to go horseback riding together. And uh, Clark really uh, saw his role as taking some of Reagan's ideas uh, and strategic convictions about the Cold War and uh, putting them into much more operational strategies. And so Clark um, you know, spends his two years as national security advisor pulling together some pretty sophisticated uh, strategic blueprints, channeling Reagan's ideas, but making sure that the rest of the American government uh, actually follows and, and implements them. Um, so he's also a very important advisor. Thanks. Uh, this next question says, uh, your book clearly documents that the Soviets genuine, genuinely believed that SDI, the Strategic Defense Initiative, would render their ballistic missiles ineffective against the US. And this fact was important in Reagan's success and the subsequent arms reduction talks. The Soviet Union fell in 1991, SDI was abandoned by 1993. Are we back to MAD as the cornerstone of our nuclear arms policy? 
Oh, okay. Good question for the, uh, the contemporary moment. I, but I, I first want to elaborate, and I appreciate the questioner because they they do get a lot of the history correct there. Um, that you know, SDI never becomes operational during Reagan's time as president. You know, he announces the plan to develop it in March of 1983. Uh, you know, he gets Congress to appropriate some money for it, but it's it's just really this this idea. Uh, and uh, a lot of scientists were very skeptical that it could ever work. Um, a lot of uh, arms control experts actually worried it could work, but they didn't like it. They thought it was, it was really destabilizing. But it's very key to Reagan's vision of transcending the balance of terror, transcending mutual assured destruction, uh, and rendering what was a Soviet advantage. They had a lot more ICBMs than the United States did, uh, rendering that um, a, a liability or, or at least at least impotent. And even though most expert opinion didn't think it could work, Gorbachev really thought it could work, and he, he was terrified of it. Uh, and uh, he was you know, enamored of American uh, technological prowess and innovation and our, our leading economy. And he thought, boy, those essentially, you know, those Americans can invent anything that they put their mind to. Um, so yeah, so as the question rightly notes, you know, the Cold War ends and the SDI program is, is wound down. Uh, but um, some of the technologies the SDI was working on are employed today, uh, you know, on a, on a smaller scale. So the you know the Patriot missile defense system that we're sharing with the Ukrainians right now, some of Israel's missile defense uh, systems, some of the other systems the Ukrainians are using, are at least derived from that original research program that Reagan had launched. Um, and now, as we are looking at you know the renewed threat of uh, the Russian nuclear arsenal and frankly a growing threat from China's small but growing nuclear arsenal, as well as you know, North Korea's existing and growing nuclear arsenal and, and missile program. Uh, yes, uh, I'm not a scientist. I can't talk about the technical feasibility of, uh, you know, in a more elaborate missile defense, but I'm I'm glad that our government is at least doing funding some research and development on that. And I, I very much hope that it can be uh, accelerated and brought to some sort of uh, some sort of successful uh, oper operalization. This is a question from Mark. It says, obviously times are different now, but did Reagan have a perspective during his presidency about China, including what might be the future prospects for that country and how the U.S. should engage with them? Same for North Korea. Thanks, Mark. Great question. Um, and I'm actually working on a, a spinoff article on this, but I haven't finished it yet. So this is a good, good prompt. I'll give you a little bit of a preview. Uh, yes, Reagan thought a lot about China. And it was um, one of the other themes in my book is just how important Asia is overall to Reagan's uh, global, global strategy. Uh, so again, that's um, if you do get a chance to read the book, something, something you'll see. But a few of the highlights of his approach to China. Uh, when he takes office, um, he inherits uh, the opening to China that Nixon had started and then Carter had accelerated. Uh, and so Reagan inherits this paradigm of China is now um, America's most important partner in Asia for countering the Soviet Union. And because China was anti-Soviet at, at the time, and that is, I think, a overall a uh, an admirable and successful strategic innovation that, that Nixon and Carter had developed. However, Reagan comes in office thinking that that has been taken too far. And his initial priorities in Asia while he, when he, when he becomes president are first deepening um, America's partnership with Japan. So even though Japan is technically a treaty ally and democracy, they're mostly seen as a trade rival, uh, an economic rival. And so Reagan wants to prioritize Japan as the most important American partner in Asia over, over China. This is why he first visits Japan in 1983 and doesn't go to China until, until a year later. The other thing that he wanted to do was to rebalance um, uh, America's commitment to Taiwan. He worried that Carter, Nixon Carter had, in embracing China, had jettisoned Taiwan too much, left Taiwan too vulnerable. And so also Reagan's first couple of years in office, he goes back, he you know sends a message to the Chinese, we're going to keep supporting Taiwan, we're going to support Taiwan, we're going to provide arms to them, and we don't want uh, there any risk there being any risk of you invading them. And so after Reagan feels like he gets things solidified with Japan as our main partner and with Taiwan as another important partner who is a little more um, 
uh, you know, protected or emboldened against uh, Chinese aggression. Then he really does some outreach to Beijing, uh, and he wants to deepen our trade ties with Beijing. Uh, he wants to keep the anti-Soviet partnership going. Uh, China becomes one of our most important partners for supplying the Mujahideen in Afghanistan, the covert action there. We do a lot of intelligence sharing with China. And so he actually is able to manage the China relationship um, on the shared interest of countering the Soviets. But he also really starts pressing China on human rights and democracy. Uh, he's appealing to them to release imprisoned Catholic priests and house church pastors. Um, uh, he gives a couple speeches over there, uh, encouraging them to, uh, to embrace uh, democratic values and principles. He knows it's an uphill battle. And so even though he wants to see their economy grow uh, and them to be an important strategic partner, he also uh, is very wary of the Chinese Communist Party and you know does not want to see it see it continue. But the pragmatist in him knows you know you only do one cold war at a time at the time the you know the main adversary was the Soviet uh, so Soviet Union and so he forges that you know kind of partnership of convenience uh, with, with China while putting it in the context of they're not our main priority in Asia compared to uh, Japan and Taiwan. Um, so it, it's a very interesting story. So there's another question that relates to China. So I'll go ahead and pose it now. This is from Steve. And he says, would you agree with the following that today Biden's strategy in relation to, relation to China is influenced or heavily influenced and informed by Reagan's convictions during the collapse of the Soviet Union and the end of the Cold War? Uh, good question, Steve. I, I've not... Um met President Biden or asked him this directly, so I, I will only speculate here. I you know, don't know how much he yeah, is influenced by Reagan on this. Um, but of course, he was a much younger senator during the Reagan era, and he certainly knew Ronald Reagan and you know, observed his Cold War strategy uh, up, up, up close, and so he'll be very familiar with it. I can certainly see some um, seeds of some Reagan principles, and so the way that Biden is trying to um, repair or deepen ties with America's allies in Asia, especially Japan and South Korea and Australia, and now bringing India in as a new partner uh, to help counter China. That's a very Reagan-esque uh, pr principle. Um, the way that Biden is trying to um, redeploy American military assets in Asia to uh, to protect our allies, especially a partner like Taiwan from potential Chinese invasion, uh, but to you know deter any any other Chinese military adventurism, I think that's certainly a, a Reagan-esque Reagan principle. Um, I would like to see Biden do more on human rights and religious freedom inside China. Um, I'd like to see him. I'm glad that he's declared the, the genocide against the Uyghurs a genocide, uh, but I'd like to see uh, more there. I think it's the right thing to do, but also that would certainly be taking a page out of the out of the Reagan Reagan playbook. Um, and similarly, I'd like to see the Biden administration do more uh, to provide um, new sources of information, radio broadcasts, internet access to the Chinese people who otherwise are dealing with a the Chinese Communist Party propaganda and not much exposure to uh, outside ideas. That was very key to Reagan's strategy towards the Soviets of trying to put in literature and broadcasting um, in that, that you know, this inform the information warfare, if you will. I'd like to see us do more of that with China. A uh, question about NATO. He says, you write about Reagan's sense of Russian history and the Russian fear of being encircled by potential enemies seeking its destruction. Mm -hmm. Did Reagan have a view about the possible and subsequent admission to NATO of the former Soviet states bordering Russia? Yeah, it's a really good question. I don't know. Uh, and now I'll, I'll give a little bit more of an answer there, but I first want to say I can't point you to uh, any, uh, I'm not aware of any statements from Reagan after he left office on, I support, you know, the these former Soviet uh, satellites, you know, you know, Poland, uh, uh, you know, Bulgaria, Romania, Hungary, um, being admitted to, to NATO or not. Uh, he, he may have made one of those statements, but I, I'm, I'm, I'm not aware of it. Um, but um, while you rightly note from the book, he was certainly very mindful of Russian history and Russia's fear of, you know, invasions coming from the, the West, whether it's, you know, Napoleon in the 19th century or Nazi Germany in the 20th century. Uh, Reagan was also very committed to self-determination. Uh, it's very important to him that each individual country be able to choose its own path forward, including choosing which organizations it will be it will be a part of. Um, while in office, he was pretty supportive of more autonomy for Soviet republics like Ukraine, uh, the Baltics, Estonia, Lithuania, Latvia, um, uh, and so I I would think. 
that he would have overall been supportive of these former Warsaw Pact satellites who really wanted to join NATO in the 1990s and, and asked to. And of course, the Clinton administration was supportive of that as well. That was that was American policy. But uh, you know, no one was coerced into joining NATO. This was really what a lot of those uh, those countries countries wanted. And um, that's pretty that that welcoming of their own uh, self-determination is a pretty consistent Reagan principle. Um, and uh, uh, even though he was mindful of, uh, of Russian, Russian fears there, he also thought that Russians were way too paranoid. And he spent a lot of time trying to reassure the Soviets, we're not trying to do a preemptive strike on you. Uh, you know, we're not out to, to, to invade you. Uh, knock it off with the, par with the paranoia. I'll get to maybe one or two more questions. Uh, this one says, at an LBJ library program, uh, in 2011, Gorbachev said that Reagan's tear down this wall speech and Reagan's hard line against the USSR was not the primary in the downfall of the Soviet Union, that it was more of the disenchantment with the old communist regime by a new Russian generation. Um, what's your reaction? Um, and did Reagan use that to kind of play as part of his greater, his, his hand, I guess? Yeah, no, th this is um, a really good question because it is something that, you know, scholars continue to debate and puzzle over, like, you know, what are the factors, what are the main causes of the collapse of the uh, the Soviet, Soviet Union and the fall, fall of the Iron Curtain? Um, and, you know, I, I first want to say it is a whole combination of things. It's these structural factors, it's Gorbachev's reforms. It's the internal uh, drive that the peoples of the Warsaw Pact countries, the peoples of the Soviet you know, Union itself had, especially the younger generation, for, for a better life. All of those are played in. But I do think that um, American policy, both the outside pressures that the Reagan administration was, was applying on the Soviet system, uh, as well as the support that the Reagan administration was providing for these dissidents and these you know, other people who want, to, want a better life, uh, that that's an important part of the story, right? The uh, the internal Soviet developments are not happening in a vacuum. They are in part being shaped by these external factors and, and external forces. And even the support and embrace that Reagan has given Gorbachev to encourage Gorbachev to continue on those reforms, right? I mean, that is... Um, uh, that also is emboldening for, uh, for, for Gorbachev to, to accelerate, his, accelerate his reforms. And he'll often even say, look, we can't keep up in this arms race with the Americans anymore that they've lured us into. Um, you know, we, we can't deal with the economic pressures that, uh, uh, that the arms race and our own uh, and, you know, American sanctions and other things are, are, are putting on us. Um, so he would often uh, nod to American pressures himself. Um, uh, again, tear down this wall. Uh, of course, the, the full line is Mr. Gorbachev tear down this wall. So Reagan knew that the Soviet, the Soviet Union had put up the Berlin Wall and he wanted them to take it down. Of course, it is the people of Berlin who tear down the wall themselves. And yet Gorbachev makes the very, I think, visionary and courageous decision not to send in the troops, not to send in, uh, you know, the Soviet army to uh, to to protect the wall and to crush any of the uh, the demonstrators there. And so he certainly, uh, like I said, is an essential part of the story too. But um, I will, as you probably can see from my book, um, give Reagan and American policy a little more credit than Gorbachev necessarily wants to give it, or at least did when he was here in 2011. Thank you. And with that, I will turn it back over to Phil Barnes, who will conclude us this evening. Thank you, Will and Martin, Mark Lawrence, and Sarah McCracken for another very special afternoon. As I note, at this time each week, many of us in the audience are members of UT Holly or friends of the LBJ Library, or perhaps both. If not, please check us out. Both organizations offer a wide variety of outstanding in-person and virtual programs, much like the one that we shared today. And thank all of you for tuning in. We will be back next Thursday, February 9th at 4 p.m. for a conversation with Lynn Hong T. Nguyen on Richard Nixon and the end of the uh, Vietnam War. Much has been written about America's war and the other side's leadership and its conflicts remain a mystery. In her book, 
Professor Nguyen unlocks that mystery for us. Don't miss it. Goodbye for now. <laughs>